Sutra, sentient beings in the ten directions, are all obscured by their thoughts. If they could renounce confused perceptions, all worldly thoughts could cease to be. Commentary: Sentient beings in the ten directions, those who have not heard the sutras being explained before, may say, "Why are there ten directions? I've only heard of four directions or eight directions. I tell you what the ten directions are." North, south, east, and west are the four cardinal directions. Southwest, southeast, northwest, northeast are the four intermediate points. Together, they make eight directions at the zenith and nadir above and below, and that makes ten directions. Sentient beings refers not only to human beings, but to all creatures endowed with blood and breath. Sentient beings are all obscured by their false, mixed-up thoughts. The more intelligent they are, the less obscured they you are by these false thoughts. If they could renounce confused perceptions, their confused views or worldly thoughts would cease to be. Views or perceptions are subtler than thoughts. Once you abandon your confused views, your deluded thoughts about this world will vanish. This is easier said than done. Sutra: All beings in the world resemble marriages. They vary only according to thoughts. Knowing that the world is based on thoughts, one departs from the three kinds of confusion. Take the analogy of the marriage on a hot day. Most people perceive it as water. In actuality, there is no water at all, and the wise do not seek water there. For sentient beings, it is that way too. Their mundane inclinations are marriages, figments of their minds. Yet the state of their minds is unobstructed. As one transcends thoughts, one also abandons fallacious arguments. When one becomes able to liberate those who foolishly cling to thoughts, removed from arrogance, devoid of worldly thoughts. One dwells in the realm of finite and infinite. These are the Bodhisattva's experience. Commentary: All beings in the sentient world resemble marriages in springtime. From afar, there seems to be a hazy, whitish expanse of water. But when one gets closer and looks, there is nothing there. The thoughts of sentient beings are likened to marriages. They are ultimately unreal. They vary only according to thoughts. The myriad species of sentient beings in the world are manifestations of our discursive and deluded thoughts. In the absence of these erroneous thoughts, such states would not exist. These distorted mental processes account for the various types of beings. Knowing that the world is based on thoughts. The Bodhisattva knows that all sentient beings are attached to thoughts. Thoughts can be coarse or subtle. For example, wishful thinking is a subtle thought. Irrational thoughts and thoughts of impossible dreams are coarse thoughts. When one realizes that everything in the world is created from thoughts, and that all beings dwell in and are attached to their thoughts, one departs from the three kinds of confusion. The master asks a disciple. What are the three kinds of confusion? Disciple, the first is confused thinking, as when one engages in false thinking. The second is confused views, and the third is a confused mind. The mind here refers to the eighth consciousness. That's correct. The Bodhisattva departs from the three kinds of confusion: confusion of thoughts, views, and mind. Take the analogy of the marriage. A marriage on a hot spring day. Most people perceive it as water. They see it and think it is water. In actuality, there is no water at all, as they discover when they get closer. And the wise do not seek water there. People with wisdom know that the marriage is but an illusion of water. Thus, they do not expect to find water there. For sentient beings, it is that way too. Just like marriages, their mundane inclinations and desires are marriages, figments of their minds seeming to exist but actually actually non-existent. Yet the state of their minds is unobstructed, 
If one can clearly recognize these perceived thoughts for what they really are and is not confused or obstructed by them, one can realize the state of the unobstructed mind. As one transcends all deluded thoughts, one also abandons fallacious arguments. In the absence of sophistry, only truth remains. When one becomes able to liberate those who foolishly cling to these perceived thoughts and trace after illusory states, out of great compassion, the Bodhisattva leads sentient beings laden with false thoughts through the Dharma door to liberation. Removed from arrogance, devoid of worldly thoughts, in cultivation one must leave behind all thoughts of arrogance. Unfortunately, most people are incapable of letting go of their own ego. They harbor a kind of self-conceit that makes them look down on their teachers and the drama. Only by leaving arrogance far behind can we cast out all deluded thoughts of this world. One dwells in the dream both infinite and infinite, the state that is endless and inexhaustible. These are a Bodhisattva's experience. What is this called? The great Bodhisattva who cultivates the Bodhisattva conduct attains this expedient drama practice, dwelling where there is no dwelling, giving rise to a mind that dwells nowhere. Sutra The Bodhisattva realizes that mundane dramas are, like, are all like dreams, neither somewhere nor nowhere. Essentially, they are eternally quiescent. There are no distinctions among dramas. Like dreams, they are not beyond the mind. In all worlds, in the three periods of time, everything is just that way. Dreams, in essence, neither arise nor perish. They have no direction or location. The three realms are all this way. One who sees this attains liberation of mind. Commentary The Bodhisattva cultivates patience in perceiving all as dreams. Dreams are unreal states. Prophetic dreams, dreams that forecast the future, are another matter. No, now the text is referring to dreams that are totally false and illusory. The great Bodhisattva who cultivates the Bodhisattva path realizes that mundane dramas are all like dreams. If we were to view life as a dream, what would be there worth hankering after, attaching to, contending over, desiring, converting, or clinging to? Dreams can neither be grasped nor renounced. You may want to grab hold of a dream to examine it, but it is intangible. You may say, I don't want to dream, but you can't control that either. Although dreams are false, they often disturb our true mind, for we are affected by our, by our dreams. In addition, our lives are just like dreams, but we don't believe we are dreaming. If someone says, you are dreaming right now, you would not believe him. You think, I am making money in the business world, or I am acquiring knowledge through my education. You take everything seriously and think whatever you do is real, not believing it is all a dream. It is as if when you are dreaming, someone said to you, Mr. So-and-so, you are dreaming. You will certainly disbelieve the person, no matter who it was. However, when you wake up without needing anyone to tell you, you know for yourself that you had been dreaming. Likewise, before we become enlightened, we are all dreaming. However, if someone were to tell us life is a dream, we wouldn't believe him or her. Once we become enlightened, however, we will certainly realize that we were dreaming, even if no one tells us so. Take a look. We all think we're so intelligent and wise, yet we don't even realize that we are dreaming. What kind of intelligence and wisdom is that? Everything is but a dream. If you don't believe that, then go on and have a good dream. Neither somewhere nor nowhere, if you claim that dreams are real, can you locate them? They aren't anywhere to be found. They happen in my sleep, you say. Then can you find them when you go to sleep? However, if you claim that dreams have no location, then why do you appear to be in a specific location in your dream? In summary, dreams are not somewhere since you can't find them. On the other hand, they are not nowhere since a very complete state appears in the dreams. In dreams. 
Essentially, they are eternally quiescent. Can you find the real substance of a dream? Take a picture of it and show me. You can't do it now or in the future. How can you photograph the dream when you yourself are in dream? You are asleep, so of course you can't take a picture of your dream. Dreams are fundamentally quiescent. In other words, they are empty and non-existent. There are no distinctions among dramas, which is how they resemble dreams. Like dreams, they are not beyond the mind. They are no different than the mind. In all words, in three periods of time, past, present, and future, everything is just that way. Everything resembles a dream. Dreams, in essence, neither arise nor perish. They have no duration or location. The three realms of existence, the desire realm, the form realm, and the formless realm, are all this way. One who sees this, who has this view and understanding, attains liberation of mind. Your eternal true mind and your pure, bright, inherent nature will be liberated from the influences of the six sense faculties. And the six sense objects. This line is very clear and simple, but no one pays heed. It says that people are all dragged around by emotions and weighed down by desires. Previously, we talked about how worm-born beings come from emotion, egg-born beings come from thought, and mushroom-born beings result from combination, and transformation-born beings from separation. People are bound by emotional love. And burdened by their desires for materialistic pleasures, thus they cannot be free. They go ahead and do things they know are wrong. Lao Tzu was right when he said, "All know what is fine, but they pursue the vile. All know what is good, but they pursue what is unwholesome. People know good deeds are praiseworthy, but they refuse to do them." They deliberately go against their conscience. The no matter how long you have listened to sutra lectures and studied the Buddha drama, you must see through and renounce such habits before you can experience liberation. Sutra dreams are neither of the world nor apart from the world. When such duality is no longer delineated, one enters the ground of patience. In a dream, one may see an array of varied images. Everything in the world is also thus not any different from a dream. He who dwells in dreamlike samadhi knows that everything mundane is like a dream, and yet not the same as one nor different. Neither of one sort nor many sentient beings commit deeds in all lands, may be defined or pure. The Bodhisattva understands them exactly as they are, equivalent to dreams in every way. The Bodhisattva understands that his practices and the great vows he makes are all like dreams, and in that way, no different from the mundane. Knowing the world to be empty and still, he does not destroy worldly dramas, for they are like images in a dream, varying in size and color. This is called patience in perceiving all as dreams. Through this, the Bodhisattva understands worldly dramas. He soon achieves unobstructed wisdom and saves vast flocks of beings. Commentary: Dreams are neither of the world nor apart from the world. Were we to search for the states of our dreams in the world, we would not find them. However, they cannot be found beyond the world either. Thus, dreams are neither in the world nor outside the world. When one knows that dreams are illusory and such duality is no longer delineated between the worldly and the world transcending, one enters the ground of patience. Our tendency、eh, to discriminate is a function of our conscious mind, our distorted mental process, and our attachments. The absence of discrimination is wisdom, liberation, and self mastery. The attainment of wisdom, liberation, and self mastery results from patience, from cultivating the drama of patience in perceiving all as dreams. In a dream, one may see an array of varied images. One may see images that are beautiful or ugly, good or bad, rough or refined, wholesome or evil. There are all sorts of appearances. Everything in the world is also thus not 
any different from a dream? That being the case, why must we be so attached? Why aren't we able to see through the facade of things and let go of them? He who dwells in dream like Samadhi, who understands that he is dreaming right in the midst of the dream, that everything mundane is like a dream. Good and wise friends, since you know everything is a dream, why don't you wake up from the dream? Why do you linger in the confusion of the dream? And yet everything is not the same as one, as a dream, nor different. If you say they are the same, they aren't. If you say they are different, they are nevertheless the same. They are neither of one sort, nor many. Sentient beings comic deeds in all lands. Sentient beings become deluded, create karma and undergo retribution. This cycle of delusion, karma creation and retribution keeps repeating, thus generating karma as profuse as most of dust in all lands. That karma may be defined or pure. At this point, each of us should shine the light within and examine ourselves. We should ask ourselves, do I modify karma or more pure karma? What is meant by defined or pure karma? I can't tell the difference, you say. Then let us explain these terms clearly. If all you think about are the five worldly desires of wealth, sex, fame, food, and sleep, you have defined karma. If you spend your time cultivating faith, vigor, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom, then you have pure karma. Wealth, sex, fame, food, and sleep are the five desires. Faith, vigor, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom are the drama of the five roots. If you can cultivate these five foundations of body daily, your pure karma will increase. If you wallow the five desires every day, your karma will be defied. The Bodhisattva understands them exactly as they are. He completely understands what is pure and what is defied. He realizes that all phenomena are equivalent to dreams in every way. He knows that all conditioned dramas are like dreams, illusions, bubbles, shadows, like dew drops and lightning flashes. One should contemplate them thus. The Bodhisattva understands that his practices and all the great vows he makes are all like dreams and in that way no different from the mundane. Dreams are the same as the all worldly conditioned dramas. Knowing the world to be empty, unreal and still, he does not destroy worldly dramas. Yet it is right within worldly dramas that the Bodhisattva cultivates transcendental dramas. He does not leave worldly dramas in order to accomplish transcendental dramas. He accomplishes them without destroying worldly dramas, for they are like images in a dream, varying in size and color. Some images are long, some are short, they are of various colors. This is the drama called patience in perceiving all as dreams. Within the dream, one awakens from the dream. Through this, the Bodhisattva understands the worldly dramas. He soon achieves unobstructed, perfectly interfused wisdom and saves vast flocks of sentient beings. Only upon attaining perfect and unobstructed wisdom can we liberate all beings without restrictions or limitations. Sutra Cultivating practices such as these, the Bodhisattva attains broad understanding. He skillfully perceives the nature of dramas with no attachment to dramas in his mind. In each and every world, all the various selves are neither inside nor outside. He knows that they are all like echoes. Just as in listening to echoes, one's mind does not discriminate among them. When the Bodhisattva hears sounds, his mind is the same way. Commentary Cultivating practices such as these, such as patience in perceiving or as dreams, the Bodhisattva attains about this broad wisdom and understanding of all dharmas. He skillfully perceives the nature of dharmas with no attachment to dharmas in his mind. He breaks through attachment to dharmas and attachment to self. In each and every world, all the various selves are neither inside nor outside. This is the patience in perceiving all as equals. Sounds from neither from within nor from without. He knows that they are all like equals. 
just as in listening to all kinds of echoes, one's mind does not discriminate among them. When the Bodhisattva hears a variety of sounds, his mind is the same way. No matter what sound he hears, his mind is unmoved. Just as the water reflects the moon, the moon is in the water, but the moon is not the water. The Bodhisattva contemplates all sounds as echoes and is not affected by sounds. Sutra He reverently beholds all such comments and listens to the sounds of the drama they speak. Measureless sutras are proclaimed. He listens yet remains unattached, just as echoes have no origin. Sounds heard are the same way. Yet within the sounds, drama can be discerned without any mistakes or contradiction. He thoroughly understands all sounds, yet does not discriminate among them. Knowing that all sounds are empty and still, he sends forth pure, clear sounds everywhere. Knowing that drama is not a matter of language, he skillfully enters the worldly realm and yet can use speech to reveal things, much as an echo resonates through the land. Comprehending the path of language, endowed with perception of sound, he realizes that sounds are essentially void, yet he speaks the language of the world. Commentary He reverently beholds the author's commands and listens to the sounds of the drama they speak. Measureless sutras, tolling texts are proclaimed. He listens to the Buddha's discourses, yet remains unattached. The Bodhisattva's non attachment is, like, is unlike our non attachment in listening to sutra lectures. Our non attachment means we forget what we have heard, we forget which sutra is being lectured and how it was explained. Why? Because we have no attachments. The Bodhisattva's non-attachment is such that he remembers yet does not become attached. He has severed the attachment to dramas, i.e. he does not hold to them as if they are real. Thus, the Bodhisattva's non-attachment is totally different from our non-attachment. Just as echoes have no origin, sounds heard are the same way. The Bodhisattva listens to sounds without attachment. In fact, sounds also have no origin. Yet, within the sounds, the sounds of all Dharma can be discerned without any mistake or contradiction. Regardless of where the sounds have an origin, they certainly do not contradict the sounds of Dharma. He thoroughly understands all sounds, yet does not discriminate among them. Knowing that all sounds are empty and still, with no substance of their own, he sends forth pure, clear sounds everywhere. The Bodhisattva speaks the drama with wonderful sounds using his vast, long tongue, one of the 32 hallmarks of a Buddha. Knowing that the drama is not a matter of language, he skillfully enters the worldly realm. The Bodhisattva understands that the drama is basically beyond the grasp of speech, conceptualization, and language. By sweeping away all dhammas and leaving behind all appearances, the Bodhisattva skillfully enters the realm of worldliness, and yet can use speech to reveal things, much as an echo resonates through the land. The Bodhisattva is able to use the words to explain principles that are beyond words, comprehending the path of all language, endowed with perception of sound. He realizes that sounds are essentially void, with no substance to them. Yet he speaks the language of the world as a means of communication. Sutra. He reveals how all the sounds in the world are both the same and different. His sound pervades all places, enlightening the multitudes of beings. The Bodhisattva who acquires this patience transforms the world with pure sounds. He expediently speaks about the three periods of time, but has no attachment to time. Commentary. The Bodhisattva is free from all attachments, worries, discriminations, dramas, and appearances. He reveals the drama of how all the sounds in the world are both the same and different. His sound pervades all places throughout the drama realm, enlightening the multitudes of beings. Why is sound needed? It is through the medium of sound that the Bodhisattva espoused all wonderful dramas to enlighten sentient beings in all worlds. The Bodhisattva who acquires this patience have, having to do with, with sounds 
transforms the world with pure sounds. He uses pure, clear sounds of Dharma to teach and transform sentient beings. He expediently speaks about the three periods of time. Although not a single period of time can be grasped, the Bodhisattva speaks cleverly and provisionally of there being a past, a present, and a future. That is just like asserting that yesterday, today, and tomorrow exist, but has no attachment to time. The Bodhisattva is not attached to anything in the world.